welcome you to our continuing discussion of the scriptures, particularly the book of Exodus. I'm Victor Ludlow from Religious Education at BYU Provo, and I have some dear colleagues with me today. On my left is Paul Hoskison. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. So across the table from me is S. Kent Brown, a well-known scholar on the Bible. We're glad to have you join with us here today, Kent. Thank you. And on my right is Richard Draper, well-known teacher here at BYU. We appreciate your attendance today. Delighted to be here. We're here to talk about some of the most intriguing and yet some of the most puzzling aspects of the Old Testament, specifically what we might call the nucleus of the Mosaic Law, the Law of Moses. A lot of little peculiar, almost picayune little commandments, and it seems like they just kind of cover all different aspects of life and human relationships and relationships between humans and God and, and all of that. And this can be quite a challenge for us to understand why would the Lord, through Moses, I mean, he brings Moses up on the mound, and why would he give him all of this nitty-gritty little detail of stuff? I mean, just aren't they grown adults? Haven't they been raised in a great civilized area of Egypt? Can't they handle themselves? What do you think? Can they, or why? Why? Well, let me, let me take a stab at this. Beginning with chapter 21 and rolling through 22 and into 23, we find ourselves in what some people call the covenant code. This is the oldest code that still exhibits influence on legal systems today uh, because it deals with matters like capital crimes. What happens when my action results in the death of another person? And so on. It also deals with, with other crimes or lesser crimes that have to do with loss of honor or loss of property. And in those cases, the Lord levies fines or penalties that, uh, that a person must pay. To be sure, we're in a different age. We, do, we don't deal with concubines anymore and the rules that govern their lives and their attachment to their husbands. We don't deal with slavery and servants uh, anymore in our society. But, but there are certain basic principles that also underlie what the Lord is telling people that, uh, that I think are important to see. So this, this code that runs for about two and a half chapters here really does underlie much of what we see in our legal system these days. I think it's important to realize also that uh, uh, when Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, they're no longer under Egyptian law. They're, they're, you could say they're a law to themselves now. And what the Lord is doing here is also, besides giving them a religious law, which we would expect the prophet to do under these circumstances, he also has to provide them with a civil law and in our day and age, we make a strict uh, separation between civil code and our, and our religious laws. Uh, and, and this is spelled out very clearly in the Doctrine and Covenants. But here in the Law of Moses, the Lord is giving them a unified law code which covers civil procedures, uh, civil crimes, and, uh, and religious laws that are very important for the sustaining of the people. When we realize that, then some of these little nitty-gritty things that come up in the Law of Moses will say, oh, okay, that's just one of their civil laws that they were supposed to. We have some similar today to that in our, in our civil codes. So it's uh, a whole I, way of life, you say, not, it, not, not just compartmentalized into maybe one day a week or just when you're... you're that's family. right. Or, or just the civil side, as it, we've got the civil. I would like to piggyback on one, one comment that you made, and that is, are these not uh, adults? Are, they, are we not dealing with a grown-up culture? No. And the answer is, frankly, we're not. <laughs> The, 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 physically, they may the, be. Physically, adults. they may be. But they have been in Egypt. Uh, they have taken upon themselves much of the Egyptian culture. Uh, they've been in Egyptian for generations. Uh, when Moses goes out to, uh, uh, was called out to meet with God, uh, Moses uh, has to get pecu uh, particulars about God so he can go back and teach Israel and convince Israel. That shows us that we are dealing with the less mature people, and therefore these statutes and commandments are to bring them into maturity. Very good. In fact, I think we ought to realize and remember that uh, in every dispensation of time, there are certain basic fundamental laws that have been a part of every gospel dispensation. Although we don't have s specific strict instructions about, say, the first principles and ordinances of the gospel, we'll see later with, with some of their washings and other acts that obviously this was a part of their, their, their gospel, as, as it were. 
uh, a tithing, uh, a taking of what the Lord has given you and sharing and in, in, in furthering His work. Uh, offerings and charity for the needy is very much a part of this and should be of every generation of God's children. Uh, some of these items you've mentioned about certain legislation for justice, brotherhood, fairness, uh, our, our relationships with each other, uh, aspects of sacrifice. I mean, starting with Adam and continuing on, uh, sacrifice is very much expected of God's children. And as we talked about earlier, the, the Ten Commandments would set the foundation for, for, for this later details. We need to remember this is built upon the Ten Commandments. You're doing that, we assume. Now here are some, some further insights. Now for the sake of our viewers, we would just like to suggest to you that what we're going to do here the next few minutes is concentrate on Exodus 21 through 24 and then 31 through 34 because it seems to be delivered in two little packages here and so we'll kind of be going back and forth here through this. Uh, Vic, may I just point out that uh, all of these little bits and pieces of code, all of these nit gritty things as, as you've mentioned, uh, all have an end, and that is to make the people holy, as it says in Exodus 22:31, and ye shall be holy men unto me. That, 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 that's what it's all about. In other words, it's, it, it isn't God somehow getting some ego rush by having Israel have to do all of these things, but rather a living God teaching them precepts whereby eventually they can become holy as he is holy. Very important. Now in this first chapter, 21, we 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 come to a phrase or an expression of judgment here that most people automatically synonymously connect with the whole Mosaic law. I'm here in Exodus 21 verse 24. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. My goodness, that seems rather harsh. We, would well, you concur with that, Paul? Uh, it does sound that way, certainly, and I think we have to put some of this in context. Um, uh, because this is partly a civil code, uh, it, it bears some resemblance to some of the other law codes that uh, were around in the ancient Near East. Most of them talked about don't kill, don't lie, don't steal, don't commit adultery, and, that, uh, and, and those kinds of things. Uh, and the way that you handle the situations that are mentioned here in uh, chapter 21 are in some ways similar to other law codes. Uh, and scholars have made a distinction between what they call a lex talionis, that is, it's a law of retribution. If you had damaged someone else's eye, well, then your eye should be damaged. And, and this is uh, uh, one of the, the uh, hallmarks of many Near Eastern law codes, not just in the law of Moses. Uh, there's also the law of Kofer, uh, which was the name that the technical term comes actually out of the law of Moses, meaning the, the law of atonement. In other words, there are other ways that you can um, uh, make up for what you've done other than simply an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And it's important to realize that there are these two aspects in the Law of Moses. But in addition to all of that technical stuff, uh, there's something very important going on here in, in verse 24. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for hand, a foot for a foot. Uh, in addition to being part of the civil code, this is also a, a very spiritual law. It, I, I think it's meant to teach the, uh, the House of Israel that you need to treat your neighbor's eye as if it were your eye, and your tooth, uh, your neighbor's tooth as if it were your tooth. We actually have no evidence outside of the Bible, uh, or in, that is, in the Bible itself, uh, clear down to the New Testament period, that the, these laws such as this one were ever literally put into effect. And, and that's led a lot of scholars to think that this is a spiritual code that's talking about reverence for life, reverence for people, reverence for all kinds of beings. Well, it seems that this also extends to servants and slaves. Absolutely. For later on it says that if I damage the eye of my servant or my slave, or I damage the tooth of my servant or my slave, then I'm liable somehow. So there, 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 there's a sense of respect for others that lies in these verses as yes. well. And so not immediate yeah. retaliation, but respect that if I've damaged someone that's yeah. serious, I, I need to do whatever I can to make amends here. Yeah, and also uh, the, the, the law actually sets limits. You'll notice it says an eye for an eye, not an eye for two eyes, or excuse me, two eyes for an eye. And, and in, in some cultures, uh, somebody hits you 
you hit them back hard. They hit you back harder, and then we have an escalation of things. But in this case, the Lord says, what's fair is fair. This is fair, this is just, and you go no further. This, 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 this is the limit. I would suggest as, as we read these chapters and all of these laws, if we, we might see some things that might be some principles or priorities in this Mosaic law. Uh, first of all, the rights of the victim. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's constantly, if, if somebody has been victimized in this way or this way or this way, or the, either themselves or their family or their property, here's what's supposed to be done. We tend to make, I think, maybe a little too much emphasis upon the rights of the accused rather than the rights of the victim. Also, there is in this Mosaic Law a certain bur burden upon the offender. You can't just say, I'm sorry, and walk away from it. There are certain requirements. You pay. You pay a penalty. You pay double. You might pay up to seven times as much. So that you'll think again the next time when you're in this situation, realizing, is it worth it if I get caught? Uh, so this burden upon the offender and the assumption, the hope, I believe, in, in, in this law is that the person who has offended the unrighteous, the wicked, would not only have respect, but also hopefully become humble and repentant and change their behavior. I mean, that's the essence of repentance is to change behavior. And so the Lord is putting emphasis on particular penalties here so that a person might hopefully really repent and not do it. And hopefully for other reasons, it's just because I don't want to get punished. And then that, excuse me, the, go ahead, the, Paul. The, the principle here again is uh, love thy neighbor as thyself. This underlies all of the, of the law code here. Mm -hmm. And then it allows the Lord to operate uh, in their life as well as, uh, I'm moving over a little bit over to chapter 23, that uh, the, the Lord promises in verse 28, then will I send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivites and the Canaanites and so on. I see hornets there as symbolic of God's spirit, God's way that's going to move before. By little and little I will drive them out from before thee, he promises. Verse 31, I will set thy bounds from the Red Sea of the Philistines all the way up, you know, and I will drive all these people out. Verse 34, thou shalt make no covenants with them, nor with their gods, they shall not dwell in thy land, lest that they make thee to sin against me. For if they serve their God, for if thou serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto thee. So he's, he's trying to keep them separate, uh, distinct, so that he can operate within their lives. There's, there's also something about God's sense of justice that lies in these passages. Uh, it shows up, for instance, here in chapter 21, where the Lord says something about the city's, the first hint of the city's her refuge. Mm -hmm. A place where the accused can flee. Change of venue. Th that's right, to change of venue. Because there was, there was a law of vengeance that was operating. It's been so since the days of Cain. He's the one who first complained that somebody who's finding him after they've learned that he's the murderer of his brother will certainly take his life. So, so there's this law of vengeance that, that is operating in the society. But the Lord, the Lord allows people to reach a place where they can be safe until there's a fair hearing. And, and I like that sense of his sense of justice, that, uh, that he, he looks out for the accused, he looks out for the victims, he looks out for third parties, uh, and, and so on. And, and, and one, one senses that in his hands, in the judgment, we're in good hands. Very good. And he also warns us of things that might blind our judgment or our sense of, of right and wrong. Uh, one of my favorite little verses is in chapter 23, verse 8. And thou shalt take no gifts, for the gift blindeth the wise and perverteth the words of the righteous. That is, uh, people with good intentions and should have been smarter when they start taking gifts or special favors or things like this, this can, this can distract us in a, inappropriately. And then there's a later passage in the same 23rd uh, chapter of Exodus that uh, I come across because of my years of association with the Jewish community. It's in verse 19. Uh, the, the original commandment, and by the way, it's one of 613. I mean, the Jewish sages have identified 613 particular commandments in these books of the Torah, the Pentateuch here in the Old Testament. But one of them that's uh, uh, most famous is this uh, at the end of verse 19, 
thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. They're not supposed to boil or seethe or cook a, a kid gold in, in its mother's uh, milk or, or fat, I guess some translations have it. But uh, as with most commandments of the Lord, he just tells Israel what to do, or in this case, what not to do, but he doesn't say why. We understand there were some Canaanite and other rituals where a similar combination of uh, goat's m m uh, milk or fat with a kid's meat cooked in it as kind of like a stew or a broth was, was a type of a sacrament, like an ordinance. Maybe this is why he's saying it. Uh, but what's been interesting is there is the basic commandment that was given to them. But then people start to ask questions, well, but what if I buy meat from one place and milk from another? Would I jeopardize having a parent-child relationship? So maybe I better not cook any meal, meat and milk together. Yeah, but what if I've been cleaning pans and I didn't do a decent job and there's a little bit of meat left in this pan and the, the meat has a child relationship to now a, a milk gravy I'm cooking in this pan. Maybe I better have separate sets of pots and pans. So for those who are familiar with, with Jewish families and what they call a kosher kitchen, this is one of the primary beginnings of that, of dairy and non-dairy products. And this is where it starts. They're to be separated. And so they'll have dairy and non-dairy meals. Now, not that fences or these kinds of personal interpretations are necessarily bad, as long as we keep them personal. I mean, I guess if it's something we choose to do in our family, that's fine. But I think as a home teacher, I shouldn't require that of all the families I home teach. Or if I'm a bishop, I, I don't think I should expect the ward to follow. Now, just because there are certain things I do on the Sabbath, or our family does on the Sabbath, that help us to keep a Sabbath spirit, little fences, little family particular laws that we set up, Maybe that's very helpful for our family and our personalities, but that doesn't mean we should require it of everyone else. And that's where the danger later came with some of these interpretations or these so-called fences around the law. As we look at these, uh, realize, all right, these ancient Israelites, this is what the Lord was doing to help train them, like you said, to help mold them from this different Egyptian culture mold that they had, and to help them learn respect and, and other uh, principles. Are there other ways that we and our families today can learn these same principles? Well, that might be kind of different and unique for us, but a family in California might not feel comfortable doing it, but that's fine. I think we can all do it as long as we're looking for those underlying principles behind it. I think one of the underlying principles behind uh, uh, the building these fences is to protect you from inadvertently breaking the law. Good point. And, and the Law of Moses does distinguish between inadvertently breaking the law and purposely breaking the law. And, and the principle here is, uh, is also, um, if you build a fence, and we do have some general fences in the church, such as don't date before the age of 16. That's a wonderful fence around mm -hmm. the law of chastity. Uh, it, you cannot forget what the fence is supposed to be protecting. You cannot forget the law of chastity. That's the law. The fence is don't date until you're 16. And, and that's meant to help you not violate the law. And, and therefore, the question is never, should we build fences? The question is, if we build a fence, is it an appropriate one, number one? And number two, are we forgetting the law that it's protecting? We always have to keep that in mind. Good which, point. What, which is one of the problems with the rabbis, is that there was the law, they built the fence, and then the fence became more important than the law itself, or at least the fence overshadowed the law, Seemed so to it, fell, that's it right. fell behind. One of the things that uh, is interesting to me, Vic, and that is as, as the Lord teaches uh, all of these principles, there comes a point in time where he, he gives it now to the people to see whether or not they will accept it. And in uh, chapter 24, verse 3, And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said all the words which the Lord has spoken will we do in verse 7 and he mm -hmm. took the book of the covenant and he read it in the audience of the people and they said all that the lord has said we will do and be obedient so so they are so it's not imposed funda fundamental law right, of this, obedience that's sustained these people sustain the lord sustain his word and say we will do it now, as, uh, it's also important here in chapter 24, we have a, a kind of another sort of a Tiffany uh, experience here of, of, of Moses and Aaron and 70 elders of Israel going up on the mount. Uh, they uh, leave the camp in, in, in Aaron's hands. 
uh, later. Uh, but in, in this case here, we have them coming up on the mount and receiving a, a marvelous uh, spiritual experience there. Uh, and, and then as part of this instruction now, originally this instruction we've been reading apparently was given to Moses and Moses passed it on to the people. They've entered into a covenant. Now Moses is joined by 70 elders that go up there. So now here's another group to receive instruction with further details. And that's why we get this repetition now in chapters 31 and 34 through this, 34. This is a classical uh, uh, covenantal setting, of course. And ratification is, is the process that's taking place in this spot where the covenant is read in the hearing of all. And then it's followed by a sacred meal. In this case, the sacred meal is partaken of by representatives of the whole group. But the representatives still, repre still bring to the whole people the, the strength of the covenant. And, and part, of this, part of this thing is the vision of the Lord which must have been stunning. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and I, let me just emphasize that too, that is so important, and that is, it is at this point, and that's important to note, at this point, it's not just Moses who sees the Lord, but Adab, Abihu, uh, others, the 70 elders of Israel, see the Lord in verse 10. They see the Lord God of Israel, so they have, the, the children of Israel have taken up on themselves the covenant, this we will do, and then their representative, as Kent points out, are up there, and the Lord now unveils himself to them. And while all of these marvelous, wonderful spiritual experiences are happening up on the mound with these representatives from all the tribes, with Moses there uh, on the mound, what's going on back in camp? <laughs> well, I think we need to turn to Exodus 32 and, and cover uh, uh, an important point here. A sad but an important a point. A sad but important point. Uh, the people have become a little bit... Um, worry that uh, Moses has not returned yet, and uh, they approach Aaron and say, uh, Aaron, let's do something. We don't know where this Moses fellow is, and uh, they convince him and, uh, to, uh, to make a, a calf, a symbol, and, and they donate their gold, and et, et cetera, that they've brought with them from Egypt. Now, um, I think we sometimes misread this, and I, I would like to uh, read verses, chapter 32, verses 4 and 5. Uh, the way that it uh, reads in, in Hebrew, just slightly differently in two places. And uh, Aaron received the, the gold at their hand and fashioned it with a graven tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy Elohim, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, the calf. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast day to Jehovah. It seems to me that, that what is going on here is that Aaron has made uh, not an image of some pagan deity, an Egyptian or an Amorite god, but rather that this has something to do with, uh, with the God of Israel. And, and Kent, I think you've, uh, you've talked about this earlier, and I think you have something important to say here. Well, actually, I'd like to redeem Aaron and his name. <laughs> in I think we case. should. Uh, after all, one of our priesthoods is named after this man. Uh, we learn from ancient Near Eastern art, where it's preserved, that it was typical in Semitic cultures, of which ancient Israel was a part, to portray the throne of God as an animal. Uh, it could be a lion, it could be a bull, or something like that, and people thought of their deity sitting on him as, his, as the throne or standing on him. Almost like these animal-like seraphs on the Ark of the Covenant sort yes. of thing? Yeah, so that, so that there's this sense that the grandeur and the strength and the speed and so on that characterizes this animal is also a characteristic of God. But uh, I, I see this passage uh, as pointing to a building of God's throne yes. rather than representation of Jehovah himself. That's right. So that, that's at least how I see this passage. And I think that's an important point. Uh, th this has nothing to do, this passage, with any pagan gods at all. Aaron is making a mistake in using this image, as it was expressly prohibited in the uh, Ten Commandments, in a worship service. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe even of making this calf in the, uh, to begin with as, as the throne of, of God. Good. 
Well, would you concur then that as we're looking through these particular chapters and all these details and many of these little specific commandments that uh, there are some underlying principles there of trying to bring a people uh, out of a very heathen pagan culture into a more committed, even consecrated covenant-making people that would have better relationships with each other and love thy neighbor as thyself and his property and his servants and so forth, but also uh, love thy Lord and, and some aspects of preparing them to receive some atonement, some, some help in doing all of this, that we realize you can't do it all by yourself. You have Moses here to help you, but maybe there are some other sources that might be helpful for you as well. If you'll do these things, then there might be some other help that might come to you. you know, we're laying the groundwork by which the people are now prepared to go into God's land, the land that he is going to give them. And again, uh, we see people prepared in this life through the commandments to enter into the eternal land, the land of the celestial. And his house, as will be talked about in the next chapters as we learn more about temples and sanctuaries and places of holiness. Well, thank you, gentlemen. It's a pleasure being with you and for your insights on these important but not so well understood chapters of Exodus. Thank you. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.